September 11th. The top, the top floors collapsed down. Oh, thank God I'm alive. That was then. This is now. Good evening, I'm Ernie Anastas. And I'm Dana Tyler. This is a special edition of Nightcast, September 11th, then and now. We've heard so many amazing survivor stories, but tonight a story you have never heard before. CBS 2's Todd McDermott introduces us to two men who watched the plane smash into their office and still made it out alive. From the ground, we watched in horror as United Flight 175 slammed into Tower 2. Now imagine being Lone Officer Stanley Premneth. He was on the 81st floor. Here I see the biggest aircraft ever bearing down on the eye level. And my mind is reacting fast. And this plane is coming with a lot of speed. I can still hear the sound. Upon impact, Stanley dove underneath his steel desk. Hundreds perished instantly, including 18 of Stanley's Fuji Bank colleagues. But somehow, he survived. I'm scared, scared more than anything. When that plane crash landed in the building, the bottom wing was stuck in my office door 20 feet from where I was under the desk. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's gonna burn and I'm gonna die. Trapped under piles of debris, Stanley thought there was no way out. But then, out of the darkness, came a light. I could hear a banging on the wall or a banging on something and this voice calling in the darkness, help me, I'm buried, I can't breathe. Armed with a flashlight, Eurobroker's Vice President Brian Clark was escaping down the tower's one remaining staircase when he came to Stanley's rescue. Two men alive on that floor, somehow he finds you and pulls you out of the rubble. I'm thinking in my heart, Am I dreaming? Am I really seeing a light? He said, I'm Stanley, and I said, I'm Brian. Um, come on, let's get out of here. And uh, we made our way back to the stairs, and we started down. But the smoke-filled staircase was filled with people running up, thinking safety could be found on the roof. My instinct was to keep descending to, to test what was there. Against all odds, the men reached the ground floor. The only people we saw there were firefighters and cops, and they were cheering us on. Run, run, get out of the building. The two men ran to nearby Trinity Church for safety. This is where we reach, and we held on to this fence, and I'm telling him, Brian, this building is going. And I said, there's no way. I said, those are steel structures. That's, those are, that's just carpeting and newspapers and furniture that's burning. And as I said that, the building just imploded. The tower they had escaped just minutes before was now a smoldering graveyard of dust, debris, and ash. They couldn't have known then they were two of just four people working in offices above where the plane hit Tower 2 who survived. It's just a, a, a sickening feeling. In the six months since that devastating day, Brian has returned to work and now manages his company's relief fund, which helps the families of the 61 employees they lost. I'm sad, very sad, that these people aren't with us, because they were wonderful people. But, but you can't change it. So it, 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 it's wasted effort to, to feel guilty. Guilt is something that Stanley still struggles with. My friends who went down when the building went, I still think about them. I still, I still see them in my dreams. I still hear their screams. I still feel that dreadful day. Todd McDermott, CBS2. The tragedy of September 11th has affected almost all of us, especially members of New York's bravest, who lost 343 firefighters in the attack. How do they race into deadly situations with the tragedy so fresh in their minds? CBS 2's Penny Crone joins us live on the east side now with their story tonight. Penny. Well, it's been a very difficult night for every firefighter in our city. Now, the men of Engine 8, Ladder 2, lost 10 10 members. They were inside tonight. They were watching the special. At the same time, they were also going on runs, protecting all of us. But tonight is a very solemn night. The men of Engine 7 and Ladder 1 that you saw in our special watched the two-hour show together in their kitchen. Out of respect to them and their victims' families, we kept our distance tonight. Those I spoke with, though, were clearly moved by the show. So many of their brothers perished, but not 
not one of us can ever distance ourselves from September 11th. And for every re rescue worker, it's as if it all happened yesterday. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. One of the guys, Jimmy Lennox, who was so moved by President Bush's speech that he took his slogan, had it made up, and then put it on the rig himself. We will not tire, we will not falter, we will not fail. Words the president said days after September 11th. Words the firefighters at Ladder 37, Engine 79, will keep in their hearts and on their fire truck forever. The president reflected the sentiments of all the firemen and their families, especially after that tragedy. Um, he was very self-assuring and assertive, and uh, we're just very proud to be part of this company, and I think the public is very much behind us now. It's back to the everyday job of being a firefighter. It appears the days, weeks, and months since September 11th have eased the heartbreak for our bravest, but it hasn't. Uh, Jerry Schrang, who was killed from Rescue 3 in the World Trade Center. Oh, I miss my buddies, first of all, and uh, I really don't know. I, I really don't know. It's, right now, it's really not fun coming to work anymore like it used to be. You know, it's just, you, you come in and you have memories of your friends that you lost. Bill Shue has worked at Ladder 2 Engine 8 on Manhattan's east side for 18 years. On September 11th, every firefighter assigned to Ladder 2 was killed when the Trade Center fell. Those who were off duty and survived think now not only about their brothers, but about change. Safety of the men first, and then uh, how to get people uh, out to safety or or a part of the building where they need to be in a safe area. More so than before September 11th? Yes, definitely. The meal for these men isn't only nourishing, it's a time to bond. The kitchen here at Engine 8 Ladder 2 is a lot different now. Yes, there's the firehouse humor. Penny doesn't like my disgusting looking zucchini. <laughs> But once it's all said and done, she's going to love it. I love it. I love it. And just being with these very special men isn't good. It's great. Oh, this is your bullpen. Chow's on, chow. The men who so bravely gave their lives for all of us watch over their brothers here and at every firehouse in our city. The men are surrounded by memories, like John Curatolo. His brother Robert worked at a firehouse a few blocks away. John carries his brother's picture in his helmet, and his locker is adorned with what was left of Robert's gear. I'm going to stay right here. I'm one house away from where my brother was, and this is where I want to be. For these men, time hasn't healed their wounds, but they're heroes, and their dedication hasn't changed, and they say it never will. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. And there isn't much else to say except from all of us at CBS2 to all of our rescue workers and all of our firefighters, thank you. Reporting from the east side, I'm Penny Crone, CBS2 Nightcast. Now back to you, Dana. Penny, thank you. The New York City Port Authority and police departments were also devastated on that fateful day, but these are not lives lost in vain. Instead, the departments are dramatically changing how they work in order to save future lives. Our Kirsten Cole is live in Lower Manhattan to explain that for us. Kirsten. Dana, most of us have felt a change in the air since the attacks happened, and that change definitely extends to our relationship with law enforcement. Many of us now feeling a newfound empathy for men and women who never know what they'll face. We see them every day, walking a beat, working a police line, or just cruising through their precinct. But seldom do we think of the officers of the NYPD as people with faces and families, or about the danger they never know is coming until they're in the thick of it. Six months ago, it swallowed them up and took 23 of New York's finest, 37 from the Port Authority, away from us forever. But from every battle, the soldiers learn lessons. Police Commissioner Ray Kelly is still studying, learning how the public's perception can change. The public is a lot more um, uh, receptive to uh, police practices, you might say, you know, to being stopped or traffic stops, that, that sort of thing. And you can feel it. And things are already changing for cadets. 
with expedited courses at the Port Authority Academy. Kelly says even more changes are planned for the NYPD, since they've gone from fighting the crimes of an overwhelming city to trying to beat back global terrorism targeting Gotham. But they're facing a shrinking force and the specter of the past. The shooting of an unarmed Amadou Diallo by four police officers. The savage precinct house attack on Abner Louima. And the buy and bust operation gone bad that killed Patrick Dorismond. The shooting here of Patrick Dorismond, as well as that of Amadou Diallo and the attack on Abner Louima, were the height of the public's perception of a heavy handed NYPD. But much of that has changed, according to the top brass at our city's police department, right down to the man on the street. And a lot of that has to do with September 11th. Before that, you basically had a you know, at least a minority, a somewhat callous uh, police department. You put a human face to it. It's nice to have people call up and say, um, you're doing a good job and we appreciate that you're here. And that's all we look for. And it's, it's sad that it took maybe something like this to, um, to, recognize, to get the people to recognize that. It's a very difficult job to do, a difficult job to do well. You do have to, a little bit more respect from people. I'd say that, uh, you know, the NYPD got a lot of bad press before September 11th. I think maybe, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit more of a prideful thing to be a cop nowadays. They see now the NYPD is more than just police officers, it's were people. People who will never forget all that has been done for us. And that was Kirsten Cole. Coming up six months after the tragedy, how safe is the air near Ground Zero? The surprising answer next. Plus, how an office worker turned into an instant hero to save a woman's life. Get her out of here. I'm going to get out. I'm going to get myself out of here, and I'm going home. And recovery workers describe what it's like being at Ground Zero seven days a week for the past six months. We'll be back. Rescue workers came together with New Yorkers in the first wave of relief on September 11th. Now there's a second wave of relief, Project Liberty. New Yorkers have come together again to provide free, skilled, one-on-one -on -one or group counseling in your home, office, school, or wherever you feel comfortable. If you're one of the thousands of New Yorkers suffering from anxiety, loss, even sleepless nights, Project Liberty can help. So join the second wave of relief and feel free to feel better. Presenting the totally redesigned Mercury Mountaineer. For your peace of mind, a best pick rating from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. For your informed decision, the best front crash test rating in its class. For your added protection, optional side curtain airbags are available. And for your cash flow, a new lease rate of $3.99 a month for 36 months with 2,678 cash due its signing on the all-wheel drive Mountaineer. The SUV built for here is here. What was the future is now online, faster than a phone connection. With Time Warner Cable's Roadrunner High Speed Online. You're always connected with Roadrunner, no disconnect. There's no waiting online to get online. It's instant. There's more time for you so you can do more with your time. Make surfing the net the experience it should be. Easy. And with downloads up to 50 times faster than through your phone line, it will be. Call 1-800-OK-CABLE -OK and receive your first month of Roadrunner free. I'm Jason Seahorn. This is my home. If I make smart moves here, my dreams can come true. This is my new home. YHG Foxens made this dream come true when they sold my house and saved me thousands of dollars. YHD Foxtons, first in New Jersey, now in New York. Saving homeowners millions with our 2% commissions. Dial 1-800-CALL-YHD. 2% real estate commissions. Now that's smart. Real estate smart. Give us a call. Introducing the redesigned 2002 M-Class. News on CBS2 is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz on the web at mbusa.com.
just how safe is New York City's air since 9-11? Well, that depends on whom you ask. Well, the EPA says that there is no danger to the general public, but doctors are seeing first-time asthma and other respiratory conditions in people who live near ground zero. CBS2 Health Watch reporter Paul Moniz has been investigating the air quality issue since day one. He joins us live from ground zero tonight. Paul? <laughs> Ernie and Dana, when the EPA says the air is safe, the agency is referring to outdoor air. The fact is no one knows just how safe indoor spaces are because no government agency has done widespread testing. Six months after 9-11 and many residents are still battling with their landlords over testing and costly cleanup. Some have grown frustrated and have begun cleaning up themselves despite the potential risks. Do you want to take your coat off? At the Drinko residence, Hospitality is measured in plastic bags, masking tape, rubber gloves, and face masks. Protection from toxic particles brought in when the World Trade Center blast blew out all 17 of their windows. This is what the place looked like one week after the attack. Six months later, it's still uninhabitable. Sometimes it's hard to even put word into words. You know, it's so overwhelming, this experience. Fashion designer Pat Jerinko and her artist husband Andy live at 125 Cedar Street, just 300 feet from where the South Tower once stood. We're going to be here while they're rebuilding. From their living room, the Jerinkos see signs of progress, a nearly cleared debris field. <laughs> the reopening of Mega Discounter Century 21, yet it seems they are stuck in time. Yeah, everything is covered here. Andy's art is encased in dust. Their artist studios are trashed. They've been forced to move to Brooklyn Heights. And because no government agency will pay for a $25,000 professional cleaning, which they can't afford, they vacuum and clean themselves, breathing in potentially deadly compounds. There's asbestos, there's lead, there are silicates, there might be mercury. The Jerinkos do wear face masks, but as we saw in our visit, they are so hot and uncomfortable, it is difficult to wear them for long periods, and often they take them off. The evidence here is... The Jerinkos are among a growing chorus of concerned residents worried about the safety of the air they breathe, especially indoors. The EPA has conducted thousands of tests on outdoor air and maintains there's no danger to the general public. But no agency is doing widespread indoor air testing, a fact Congressman Gerald Nadler blasted at a recent hearing. This is absolutely unacceptable. Private contractors working for landlords have detected everything from asbestos to dioxins and mercury inside apartments and offices. Spikes of lead have caused concern at Stuyvesant High School and PS89. Meanwhile, the Jerinkos are determined, trying to piece their lives back one item at a time. This is my home. I want to come back here. Yeah, I can imagine living my life and dying here. But in the back of Pat's mind, she knows what's in her apartment could kill her. Back here live at Ground Zero, it's important to keep in line that many of the toxins from the site behind me are actually invisible and odorless, things like asbestos and mercury. And because you can't see or smell them, you may be thinking that your apartment or office is safe when it may not be. Tomorrow, for the first time, a recently established indoor air task force by the EPA will meet. We will have more on that, of course, tomorrow. And many people are calling for door-to-door -door testing to make sure that all indoor spaces are safe. Reporting live from Ground Zero, Paul Moni is back to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Now let's take a look behind the headlines to understand the enormity of the task at Ground Zero. The, the recovery site covers 16 acres of land. The pit is some seven stories or 70 feet deep. Workers are expected to finish clearing debris by this summer, several months ahead of schedule. And there was enough concrete in the World Trade Center to build a pavement from New York to Washington. And there was enough steel to build another three Brooklyn bridges. From 3,000 emergency workers every day and every night back in September to about 1,000 a day now for the past six months, construction crews, firefighters, police officers, and EMTs have worked together to clean up Ground Zero and search for any victims. Tonight, they describe the incredible physical and emotional challenges of that job. What you see on TV and, and what you see in the paper just does not reflect the magnitude, the intensity of what's here. They have cleared more than a million tons of debris and recovered thousands of buried souls. It's been really rough. We've, you know, come apart 
body parts and my guys, some of them really had a huff, tough time handling it. What about the personal sacrifices you've had to make? Well, away from my family, 12 hours, 12 hour days, seven days a week. I'm proud, that's what, that's what makes me wake up every single day. Every, I know I had to wake up like five o'clock in the morning to get here at seven, I don't mind. At first, they say we cheered them on as heroes. But as the city began to heal, some felt they became painful reminders of what we lost. In the beginning, it was like, hey, we're going to win on the train. You want a seat? We'll give you a seat. No problem. You know, now it's people look at you and just put their head down. Still, their devotion never wavers. Uh, to be around these many guys and not see one fight, this is like really sacred ground. The firefighters that we see here today, they're kids. They they're kids. There's some of the saddest things you see here are uh, firefighters, children digging for their fathers, and firefighter fathers digging for their children. And we will continue to do that here until there's no possibility of recovering remains. And that day, Commissioner Shearer says, will be the toughest day of all when he has to tell the families of victims never found that the search is over. He says that will probably happen sometime in June. Ernie? New York City and Port Authority Police Departments will honor their lost heroes tomorrow. NYPD officers will gather in front of their precincts and other department locations at 8.30 in the morning. They'll read a list of names of the 23 officers killed on September the 11th. The Port Authority will mark the six-month anniversary with a minute of silence at 8.46 a.m., the moment the first hijacked plane hit the World Trade Center. Flags at Port Authority facilities will fly at half-staff all day. The agency lost 75 workers in the terrorist attack, including 37 police officers, the largest one-day loss of life by any police department in America's history. On September 11th, so many people risked their lives to save others. And tonight, Michael Pomerantz has the amazing story of one New Yorker who truly defines what it means to be a hero. One of my reps screams, oh my God, and the building starting to, to violently shake. Tower One had been hit, and communications executive Michael Benfante was on the 81st floor. I was just screaming at the top of my lungs to remain calm, stay calm. Through the mangled remains of his office, Michael led his staff to the stairwell and started down. But on the 68th floor, something stopped him in his tracks. I saw this woman in her motorized wheelchair. I didn't know who she was at the time. She was Port Authority employee Tina Hansen. Michael now faced a tough decision. Should he continue with his team down the stairs to safety or stop to help this complete stranger and risk perishing in the flames? I don't think I would have been able to live with myself unless I helped her. As precious seconds ticked away, Michael and a co-worker, John Sakara, lifted Tina up in her wheelchair and began the long and perilous descent down 68 flights of stairs. I was like, I'm going to get her out of here, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get myself out of here, and I'm going home. And that's all I, I thought about. For an hour and 40 minutes, through smoke and debris, Michael and John carried Tina and her wheelchair down the 68 flights of stairs of Tower One. But as Tina, Michael, and John reached the crowded bottom floors of Tower Number One, panic set in as rumors circulated that Tower Two had just collapsed. I didn't want it to enter my head, but I knew the situation wasn't getting any better. I always try to think about the light at the end of the tunnel. Finally, daylight came. Michael and John rushed Tina to a nearby ambulance. That's when she finally became upset. She started to cry and she motioned for me to give her a hug. So I, I, I stepped into the ambulance and I gave her a hug. After 100 death-defying minutes together, down 68 flights of stairs, Michael and John finally said goodbye to Tina. Just minutes later, they were running for their own lives as Tower One fell to the ground. It's overwhelming. I just can't believe I, I'm here sometimes. In the following weeks, Michael and John were celebrated as heroes. The words, uh, I'm glad to be here, as you can imagine, have taken on a whole new meaning. But Michael says these happy moments can't overcome the sadness he still feels six months later. I've been going to church every, every Sunday again, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it, when I'm in church, it's, it's hard to keep it together. The, the firemen haunt me a lot, and the fact that I was going down and they were going up. You know, if you talk about heroes and you talk about bravery, that's... That's, that's being brave. As for Tina, 
Michael had never even asked her her name. Luckily, they were reunited days later through a reporter at People magazine. I'm really glad to know him. Yeah, I'm glad to <laughs> that he was there. There were so many things that I, 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 I could have done differently that would have made a difference of whether I'm, I'm sitting here today or not. Whether I decided not to help Tina and I got out at the time the, the Tower 2 was falling, maybe she was there to save us. Michael Pomerantz, CBS 2. And after the terror attacks, America faced another harsh reality. It was time for war. Tonight, signs the battle is slowing down, but far from over. Then ratting out the terrorists who caught a nation off guard. See why six months later, the number of arrests is actually very small. Rescue workers came together with New Yorkers in the first wave of relief on September 11th. Now there's a second wave of relief, Project Liberty. New Yorkers have come together again to provide free, skilled, one-on-one -on -one or group counseling in your home, office, school, or wherever you feel comfortable. If you're one of the thousands of New Yorkers suffering from anxiety, loss, even sleepless nights, Project Liberty can help. So join the second wave of relief and feel free to feel better. What's up? Hey, what's up? What's up, man? So, where you want to go? What do you mean? Hey, guys, where do you want to go? <laughs> Classic. <laughs> the Civic from Honda. It figures. ATMs let you preset for one-touch withdrawals. Oh. There's a way to make banking better, and we're working on it. If you or a loved one have ever taken the drug Spondamin or Redux, also known as FinFin, you may be entitled to compensation. It may not matter if you've already registered for the national settlement. It may not matter if a previous echocardiogram failed to show injury. If you or a loved one have taken FinFin, call 1-877-200-5900 to see if you qualify for a free echocardiogram. The settlement deadline is set and fast approaching. It is urgent for you to act now. Springtime, the perfect time for Volvo's spring break when you'll find special values on every 2002 Volvo. Like the spirited Volvo S40. But remember, these special offers end March 31st. Volvo Spring Break. Nature has a new lease, shouldn't you? Take a look now at the latest facts on the terrorist attacks. More than 2,800 people died at the World Trade Center site. 189 people died in the crash of the Pentagon in Washington. And 44 people were killed in the crash of United Flight 93 in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And there is this to report also about an hour ago, another victim recovered at ground zero. Strong winds shook our camera, but you can see workers removing the victim from the World Trade Center site there. There is no word yet on whether the victim may be a civilian, a police officer, or a firefighter. In the war on terror tonight, military officials say the major fighting against Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces is over, but the operation to weed out terrorism is as strong as ever. CBS 2's David Diaz joins us with the latest developments tonight. David. Yes, thank you, Dana. Tonight, there's reason for optimism about the outcome of the latest campaign to root out Al-Qaeda fighters in the area of Gardez that you see there on the map. At the same time, there's some disagreement among top U.S. officials on just how much more needs to be done. The battle was not over. Still, some 400 GIs, dusty and weary from the fighting, returned to their base in Bagram after a week of tracking and battling Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. How was it? Uh, it was more fun than words could possibly express. 
In the frigid valley surrounded by snow-packed peaks, U.S. and coalition forces look to hunt down an enemy.